while I will be presenting some questions this evening, uh, uh, Dr. Garabedian has a presentation to share with us. And of course, we'll be filling some of our time in with questions from you, our, our audience. Please, uh, if you're on Zoom, uh, place your questions in the chat function. I will do my best to get to some of them uh, as we go through the conversation tonight. If you're on Facebook, drop some questions in the comments section. Uh, our board chairman, uh, Mato Senekeremian, is monitoring for uh, comments and questions and will be sending those to me. Our focus this evening is on the humanitarian crisis in Armenia and Artsakh, and we will be limiting our conversation to that topic. Before introducing our guests this evening, I, I just want to connect the dots a little bit between uh, our conversation tonight and what the Armenian National Committee is advocating for in Washington, D.C. Uh, right now in the aftermath of the Artsakh War. Uh, if you aren't following the Armenian National Committee online or on your social media platforms, I strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, visit anca.org slash alert anca.org slash alert, where you can get the latest on the priorities that the ANCA is working on uh, right now. Uh, we at the local level can support uh, that critical work. In fact, our partners in Washington, DC, and uh, Armenia and Artsakh are actually counting on that. So we at the local level have a lot uh, to do. And as someone posted, uh, please become a rapid responder. That's a fantastic way to make sure that the a national organization can send out letters and communication to key audiences immediately on your behalf. It's an excellent tool and very, very effective. Um, but uh, getting back to what we're advocating for and tonight's discussion, I just wanna let you know that uh, the ANCA is working on appropriating or getting the United States government to appropriate $250 million in United States emergency assistance to address the vast humanitarian crisis on the ground in Armenia and Artsakh. And there are a number of other priorities that they're working on, uh, but that piece will be very relevant to tonight's discussion. I'll just mention two other things. Uh, we're working on getting a more long-term, large-scale reconstruction and development aid to Artsakh to really create the conditions on the ground for a sustainable and safe return of refugees to Artsakh. Uh, the, the country has to be uh, uh, secure and there has to be reconstruction and investment in order to create the conditions for long-term viability. Um, another thing I'll point out among the uh, many priorities uh, that we have to focus on is providing uh, American assistance to document, protect, and preserve Artsakh's churches, monasteries, cemeteries, and other Christian Armenian holy sites uh, sadly, many of those, as you know, have, have fallen into the hands of Azerbaijan, and we have absolutely no faith that they will uh, preserve and protect those sites in the long term. So that's another uh, critical priority that the ANCA is working on in terms of pushing the United States government to provide the aid and assistance that's needed short term as well as, as, well as long term. So there's a very long road ahead. Um, sometimes it feels insurmountable. Um, but today I was, I was uh, at work, I was talking to some colleagues and someone brought up the, the, the famous quote from the American cultural anthropologist, Margaret Mead, uh, where she says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And it's with that quote in mind that I was moved today when I saw a post on Twitter, I, I think it was the... Um, Armenian National Committee Western Region, uh, one of their board members posted on Twitter, reminding all of us that today, December 10th, 1991, uh, the people of Artsakh chose their destiny, voting for independence and their right to self-determination. So, so indeed, it, we shouldn't ever doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world and, and change their destiny. You're here tonight. Uh, because you're interested in knowing more, uh, you have and will continue to support uh, Armenia and Artsakh as a concerned member of the diaspora. Um, you know, wherever we are in the world, we're few, but we always come together, kind of get together and commit to doing what's right, doing what's necessary for the continued survival and prosperity of our nation. 
And these for sure are challenging times, but all we have to do is look to our guest, uh, this evening's guest, to find example of courage, commitment, and hope. Uh, it's my, my honor to introduce Dr. Shankar Abedian. Uh, Dr. Garabedian is a former San Franciscan, uh, well known to many of you. He served in our St. Gregory Armenian Church in San Francisco. He was very active in groups like the Armenian Youth Federation, He's a son of our longtime KZV Armenian school teacher and principal, Yeran Garabedian, and his father, uh, who sadly passed away last year, is, is fondly remembered by many, many of us here, especially those in the home men and scouting circles, and we fondly uh, uh, refer to him as, as Akela. So, so we miss having the entire family here in the Bay Area, uh, a wonderful family. And Shant, uh, after he kind of uh, grew up here and went to high school and, and university, I think at UC Davis, if I recall, um, he went to medical school and did his, and then did his residency at a hospital in, in Tennessee. And he liked it so much, he decided to make the volunteer state his home. So that's what he calls home. He's married and has two uh, beautiful children. Uh, Gara Bedian is an osteopathic physician and is the medical director at Dyersburg Hospital Emergency Department. Uh, when Artsakh was attacked, uh, Shant heard the call of duty and quickly arranged to participate in a volunteer medical mission to lend his services, uh, his expertise. Uh, he recently returned from Armenia where he treated the wounded soldiers and civilians during the war. And he's here tonight to talk about the medical realities on the ground uh, in Armenia and Artsakh. So Shant, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, I wanna thank you uh, for your service to, to the Armenian nation. Uh, you know, not, not all of us have skills uh, that are really relevant or immediately applicable in a humanitarian crisis. But doctors and medical professionals certainly come to mind. Uh, but it's not just about having the skills, uh, having that capability. It's about having the courage and the commitment to actually insert yourself willingly uh, into a difficult and dangerous situation and make a difference in people's lives and, and save lives. So I think I speak for all of us uh, tonight uh, in extending our gratitude to you and your fellow volunteers in Armenia, Artsakh, and, and around the world. Um, uh, I'd like to begin by just laying out a few questions, uh, broad questions. I know you have a presentation, so I think we talked about you maybe um, kind of walking us through that, and then we could come back to some questions. But just initially, uh, Dr. Garabedian, what a war breaks out, how do you decide that you're gonna go and put yourself in, in a really what is a very dangerous situation? Did your family and colleagues understand? Uh, what were the logistics? Uh, you know, you're dealing with a COVID crisis in your hospital in Tennessee, and, and then you're flying halfway around the world to deal with a war and, and, and a COVID crisis there layered on top of that. So the conditions must have been, um, you know, uh, difficult and challenging. So uh, why don't you take us uh, from Tennessee to Armenia and, and let us know what you what you found on the ground there. Sure, sure. Thank you, Sivak, for that intro. I mean, that's absolutely wonderful. I, uh, I'll tell you, uh, I owe a lot of gratitude to my Bay Area uh, uh, Armenian family who, you know, when we say former Bay Area, I still consider myself uh, 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 San Franciscan. And, uh, and I'll tell you legends like your dad and Gersh Hajad, you know, I, you know, I still remember sitting in the ANCA office, licking stamps across the table from him, you know, when I was 16, 17, 18 years old, doing these mailers, trying to understand, you know, when you're that young and in the AYF, trying to understand what high tide really is all about and, and how it can help, you know, uh, our people and our country. Uh, I, I owe a tremendous amount to, to people like him. They were definitely pioneers and, and set the example for all of us. Um, uh, so during the first Artsakh war, I was quite, I mean, I consider that young. I was 20, 21 years old, still uh, in college, still trying to figure out life and, you know, had responsibilities, had some thoughts about the future um, and, and felt bad that, I couldn't go and serve. Now that war was quite different, obviously, and some people did go and served very bravely and heroically. I just, I just didn't. I mean, you know, some people are 
are soldiers and fighters and some are not. And maybe that was just a little bit much for me at the moment. I do remember driving around and actually your dad's burgundy van picking up clothes. And we did that during the earthquake. We did that during Artsakh, just trying to, you know, we, we, we did the supportive stuff in the back uh, more so than the front lines. Uh, so I always felt a little bit guilty maybe about that, that, that some people did go and, and and uh, some even you know, gave their lives, but I just wasn't probably brave enough at the moment. Um, and I always figured at some point, something was gonna happen. I mean, you know, we, you know, we were surrounded by enemies and, and sooner or later, they're gonna want something from us. And, and you know, it's un somewhat of an uh, uh, unpredictable uh, uh, environment. And as a physician, I mean, I'm an ER doc, so you know, I'm I'm eager to uh, get in the fight from the healthcare standpoint. To and I have I have skills and services that I could offer uh, my fellow Armenian soldiers. Civilians really didn't matter. So uh, I remember vividly when the war started. It was on a Sunday, and I happened to be in Atlanta, uh, and I read it on BBC, and I just could not believe it. Um, and uh, but. In the back of my mind, I said, okay, well, this is the time. I'm, I'm mentally prepared, I'm physically ready, um, and this is sort of what I've been thinking about. And, uh, and so from then on, I started planning. Now, back then, there was no coordination effort whatsoever. It was really to each their own. I mean, if people wanted to go, they just went. Uh, they, they didn't have to ask permission from any government agencies. They didn't have to figure out where they were going, they would just up and go. And I admire that. And that was, I did reach out to, to a few people. One was actually the Artsakh rep in, in the US, but because the fighting was so vicious at the time, they were, and, and they seemed to have enough, I mean, it's the typical Armenian, Armenian thing to say is, you know, we're okay, we're okay. And, and uh, they said, well, we're okay right now, but we'll let you know when it's time. I said. So I, I, I was excited and then I was a little deflated initially. I said, well, I mean, I'm really eager to go, but I guess I'll just wait just a little bit. Um, but in the meantime, I started gathering supplies. Now, as an ER doc, I never have to buy supplies for my emergency department, right? I mean, I don't have to buy a suture, IVs, uh, IV tubing, masks. I, I, that's, that's something that the hospital purchases, not me. And um, well, that's what I had to do. I had to learn how to, you know, where to buy these things, set up accounts, because my thought process was, okay, I need to be where the wounded are, or at least as close as I can get to them within a fairly, you know, safe manner, if that's even possible. Uh, because as an emergency physician, that's where I can do the most, uh, have the most uh, benefit, uh, right? I mean, if I'm sitting back in Yerevan and it takes them six hours to get to me, at that point, they don't need an emergency physician anymore. I mean, that golden hour of trauma is truly a golden hour. If someone's going to bleed to death, or they can't breathe, or they have a collapsed lung, or you know, a wound that's just uh, you know giving them fits, that's not going to last them six hours. Typically, they'll exsanguinate by the time they get to to the help that they need. So the the equipment and the supplies I bought were essentially geared for. What do I need to set up a mini trauma emergency department, uh, even under a tent if it need be, wh wherever? I, and, and those are all the supplies that I started to purchase. Initially, I, I thought, okay, well, I'll do uh, you know, uh, one, you know, one suitcase full of supplies, one suitcase for you know, me and my clothes, and I'll be good. Well, the one suitcase of supplies eventually turned into six boxes and I didn't know this, you don't, you can actually take ship boxes with you. Uh, they had to have certain dimensions, maximum size, but I got the most, the, the allowable size that I could possibly take. And it ended up being six altogether, plus my suitcase um, from, you know, chest tubes, IV cath kits, uh, bandages, you name it, the uh, crite kits, because I didn't, I wanted to be self-sufficient, right? I didn't want to get there and I say, oh, I need this, 
And they're like, well, we don't have that. And, and there's no way for me to communicate with anybody to know exactly what they have and what they don't. Again, this is, you know, early on in October, let's say the first week of October. Now, so this is going on in the back of my mind. You asked, how did I tell my, my, my wife or my, my, or my mom, right? So uh, my wife, I thought would be kind of tough, but, and she may be on this, so I have to be careful how I say this, but I sort of broke it to her somewhat gently. I mean, we, she was laying in bed and I was just kind of sitting there next to her. And I said, look, I'm really thinking about going. Without blinking, Sivak, she looked at me, she said, yeah, I knew you'd probably do something like that. I said, okay, what do you think? She goes, absolutely. I said, okay, well, that, you know, that's one person off, off the list, right? So she's, she's all for it. Well, then I had to tell my kids. Um, my son, without a blink as well, said, hey, I, you know, if you can help him, dad, you should go. He's 14 years old, Alec. Uh, my daughter was a little bit more hesitant because she's the thinker, right? So she goes, isn't there war there? I said, yeah, well, why do you want to go if there's war? I said, well, that's the whole point is I need to go and help the wounded. She said, yeah, but that sounds too dangerous, Dad. I really don't think you should go. So she took it harder, um, but eventually gave, gave her, you know, her approval. Um, then ultimately came digging yet on, right? So, uh, uh, I, I did, I did worry about her quite a bit and I had to, so in the meantime, I already bought my ticket, right? So I bought my ticket for November the 2nd because I couldn't go in, August, uh, in October because our schedule was already set. We were in the middle of a pandemic. You know, uh, we were all working, you know, our shifts and we were quite busy. I just couldn't bail on my docs. Uh, so I said, all right, well, I haven't made the November schedule yet. I said, I'll just, you know, ask them who can work. And then, and, and once I got that schedule, then I, you know, I gave myself basically the whole month of November off, thinking that I'm going to be there. My return flight was November the 25th. And then I put, built in a three-week cushion on the end of that, meaning I'm actually uh, yet to go to work. I'm not scheduled to go to work till December the 15th. Because I said, what if I need to stay longer? Because I don't want to get there, start doing some work, and then bail on them, you know, setting setting up a unit and then going, okay, well, I got to go home to my comfortable living and you guys are on your own. So I wanted to build in a cushion. Um, and, and when the schedule worked out, I bought my ticket. Then I told, I gently told my mom, I said, mom, I'm thinking of going and taking some supplies. She didn't say anything, you know, she said, oh, okay. You know, I, I think she sort of just ignored me. And then a few days after that, I said, mom, I'm really thinking of going and helping. She said, you know, and she was glued to the TV, right? Probably like every other Armenian in the diaspora, uh, watching the news as to what was going on. And she said, you know, that's funny you say that because they're, and she may be on this uh, video as well, but I, I apologize. <laughs> but um, she said, um, you know, they've been announcing on the news that they want professionals to show up, not just any willy nilly people that are gonna get in their way. I wasn't sure how to take that, but I assumed that she was good with it, you know? Um, I said, okay, mom, so what do you think if I just actually go and, and try to work as a doctor? She said, yeah, I think that's fine. And then she came back with, I just don't want you to carry a gun. I said, well, uh, that's fine. I don't, I don't necessarily want to carry a gun, but I said, I will tell you on the front end that if I have to defend myself, I will. I'm not gonna basically just be taking prisoner taken prisoner without any sort of a fight. She said, fine. And so mom was done. So mom was, I mean, she wasn't easy, but she understood, right? I mean, that, and frankly, I just blame her for it. I mean, her and my dad, I mean, they're the ones that raised us this way. And so it is what it is. I, obviously, Seva, there, there was a, there's danger, right? There is danger. I mean, if it was, if there was none, they, they, they wouldn't need me. I mean, but considering that I still felt that it needed to be done. I don't, I, I just didn't think that my life was any more valuable than all these other people that were going, uh, the, the Armenians that were going, I mean, the young people that had no choice but to go. Um, I have a choice and more or less my life is pretty solid. I mean, I'm not abandoning anybody really. I mean, uh, uh, you know, you have young fathers, you have 
brothers, sisters even from Armenia, just up and leaving. And, you know, they have obligations much more than I do, but they're not blinking like we are, or like, you know, I should have maybe, I don't know. Um, so long story short, it was set. Mom gave me her approval. My wife did, my kids did. I had the ticket. I started just buying supplies like crazy and getting ready. And, and, uh, and I couldn't wait. My mind was already there. The last two weeks of work were, were a blur because I mean, I was just like a machine getting it done, knowing that on, on Monday, the November the 2nd, I'll be on a plane to Europe. And, and Sean, when you, when you got there, um, uh, what, what did you, um, what was the, the situation on the ground in terms of, uh, I mean, you obviously land in Yerevan, you, you, you know, the capital city, but what, uh, what was the condition of patients, uh, both civilian and military? Sure. What sure. was the um, medical infrastructure kind of, uh, and then where did you go from Yerevan? It sounds like you were out towards the border regions in Varganis yes. and, and Goris. Uh, well, if you're of, okay, let me get into my pictures and yeah. I'll talk through them because that'll okay. cover a lot of those questions for sure. Ab absolutely, so, and, and the visual yeah. is great. Yeah, people. there's only about 24, and uh, let me make sure I get this going here for you guys. Uh, share, and then one, here we go. So my, uh, this is obviously uh, at the Head of Arag, my first day. This is uh, uh, Wednesday morning. By the way, uh, Armenians in Armenia do not wake up at you know, six or seven or eight. I mean, I think it's probably, well, it says right there, it's 8.15 and there's hardly a soul around, uh, you know. Uh, so, all right, so this is me uh, on my way. I just want to divert just for a little bit or, or uh, uh, go to on a tangent. The, the excitement started on the plane between Atlanta and Paris when uh, a Syrian Muslim woman almost died. She essentially passed out sitting in her seat. And the only reason I knew what was happening is people, the, the flight attendants were rushing back with bottles of oxygen. And I'm going, okay, that's not a normal sight you see on, a, on an airplane. So I stuck my nose and sure enough, her blood pressure was in the 70s or 80s, diaphoretic, essentially, you know, minimally conscious, if any at all. Um, so I managed to start an IV. Uh, gave her some fluids, put her on oxygen. And we're, by the way, we're literally over the ocean at this time. And so we had, we either were going to turn all the way back to the U.S. or stop somewhere in uh, Greenland or wherever, I don't, maybe Iceland. So long story short, she did well and the crew was absolutely ecstatic. So this is a pig, they pulled me up to the cockpit. I'm flying on a Boeing 787 Dreamliner. And I'm sitting, I guess, in a jump seat uh, as we're getting to land in Paris. Uh, if you've ever been in a cockpit of a Dreamliner, it is amazing. And I'm, I'm not a big flight geek, but this was once in a lifetime thing, I think. So I was there through the landing, actually. Here are the pilots. By the way, so the chief pilot on the left, he turns back to me with something written on, on paper, said, is this name Armenian? Because of course I'm telling him, hey, I'm Armenian. I've got my Artsakh shirt on. Uh, and he was, is this an Armenian name? And it, it didn't sound like a typical Armenian name, but it had an IA. And I said, well, it could be, I'm not sure. He goes, yeah, some of my relatives have that name. I said, okay, that's cool. You know, very neat. I mean, they're French, right? So they, they know Armenians. Uh, it was kind of cool because the flight attendants were so, so happy. They said, what can we do for you? I said, listen, I've got six boxes in the belly of this plane that have to go to the next uh, to the next connecting flight to Yerevan. Please make sure they get there because in Paris sometimes things get lost. So they made sure that stuff got there, which was very nice. Anyway, that's my flight out. Uh, here are my boxes. This is at Zivart Notz Airport. My uh, six boxes plus my suitcases up on the top. Um, Somebody from the Foreign Affairs Department uh, was supposed to meet me there to help me through customs. That didn't pan out, so I had to fend for customs on my own. I don't want to belabor that point, but it was not pleasant. They wanted to keep all the supplies, but I absolutely refused. Uh, and my Palutsi and Khalpetsi Damar kicked in, and I was able to walk out with my supplies about an hour later. 
so the first night I spent at the Marriott, uh, so that was Tuesday night, it was late anyway. Wednesday, it was a back and forth, back and forth. Are you gonna go today? Are you not gonna go? You know, the coordination wasn't just perfect. So finally, Wednesday afternoon, they said, yeah, yeah, an ambulance is gonna come by and they're gonna take you to Goris. Initially, they said they're gonna take me to Stepanagir. I said, that's fine. Then they changed it to Goris. So this is me in the back of an ambulance with all my boxes. And when I was stacking the boxes, I was piling up like one on top of the other, but the guy, the driver insisted that he put some flat. And I couldn't figure out why until we took, until we basically got on the road. So he went lights and sirens, I mean, I thought, I thought if I'm going to die on this trip, this is where it's going to be because it was literally, I think, four and a half or five hour drive of bumpy roads. Now I know why he made them all flat because otherwise they would have broke through those glass and, and, and gone on the road. It was, it was terrifying. And I didn't have a seatbelt where I was sitting. I was hanging out for dear life. Um, so just to give you a visual, I don't know if you could see my pointer. Yerevan is up here. So, and Goris is down here. So it's about a, on a typical drive, it will probably take you about five hours easy, I think. Um, we made it, I think in about four, four and a half, um, stopping at one time. And just to give you an idea, the border is sort of right about here. Here's Lachin right there. So, so Goris essentially is the largest city in Armenia with a, medical system or a hospital uh, closest to that eastern border with uh, Artsakh or Azerbaijan. Um, so again, here's, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, but here's Goris down here. And here's the Armenia-Azerbaijani border. See, so it says Azerbaijan there and Hayastan there. And then here's Shushi, let's say. And then Stepanagir is a little bit further up. And Pertsor, which is what we call it, and Lachin is what the Azeris call it, was right there. So um, the closest I got to the border was uh, Khansoresk, which was more in this area here. So quite close, but not quite uh, across the border. So essentially, the reason I could not get to Stepan I did, um, be, it was because the road through Lachin was uh, absolutely unsafe. They said it was closed. So what was happening already by the time I, I got there, so that was Wednesday, November the 4th, I guess would that be? Uh, the the Azeris were already infiltrating those areas and, and they didn't feel like it was safe passage, which also meant that we couldn't receive many wounded to Goris. Um, this is the bed and breakfast that I stayed in. Just a quick story about this. I called Dikron, the owner. I found this online. This is in Goris. I found this place online here in the States. And uh, I called the number. It was a, name, a guy named Dikran. I said, hey, Dikran, you know, I want to, you know, I'm going to come stay here. I need, I need a room. He said, OK, no problem. Just call me when you get here. I said. Okay, well, do you need my name? No, 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 just when you get here, call me. I said, okay, so I call him Wednesday night. I get there late, like around 9, 9.30. And you know, our Eastern Armenian, Western Armenian, there's, you know, there's sometimes lost in translation. I said, so I call him again. He goes, yeah, 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 just go, go to the hotel. There'll be a room there. I said, okay. I show up and his, his mother opens the door. He goes, okay, you know, they gave me a room. I said, great, it was a tiny room on the first floor. So then I go, um, I wake up the next morning and I go upstairs and I'm surrounded by soldiers. Every room other than mine is occupied by a soldier. Military fatigues, AK-47s. I mean, I was, I was a little, I was excited to see Armenian soldiers. I was also a little intimidated, but basically Dikran had dedicated his whole hotel free of charge to soldiers. He would feed them every morning, uh, even wash, you know, the, the, his mom would wash their clothes and hang them outside. Phenomenal, phenomenal guy. This is how Armenians support the war effort in Armenia, right? I mean, they may not have a lot of money to give, but they give it with their services. Um, so this is outside Goris, the medical center. Fairly nice building, three stories, uh, operating rooms. So the way the military had set, this is not primarily a military facility, it's a civilian hospital. 
but what they had done is the military hospital was in Khunsoresk. They were triaged, mass casualties there. And then the really bad ones that needed immediate surgeries, they would send to Godis, which would be about a 15 minute trip by car, by ambulance or whatever, however they want to get him there. And they had surgeons from all over the world, primarily Moscow, surgeons, including general surgeon, vascular surgeons, anesthesiologists, ICU specialists. Um, and and uh, they were all set. I mean, they had a lot of neat new equipment that was recently sent. I mean, they had digital uh, um, uh, digital X-ray machines and ultra, bedside ultrasounds. I mean, they had some cool stuff, but the day-to-day -day stuff they were lacking some. You know, they needed ambu bags, IV kits, and things like that, which I had I had with me without knowing what they needed. Um, Robert is on my uh, is on my left. He is uh, he's an ER doc. ER there is still sort of a, in juvenile stages. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, he's a very young guy. I mean, medicine there is, it's still developing, right? I mean, it's not really up to par with us yet, but they still do what they can with what they have. Uh, I got to hang out with Robert quite a bit because we were sort of the ER docs. Um, so uh, I'll get to this in a minute. So we're in I'm in Goris. I got there Wednesday night and I stayed there until Monday. So as you know, the war kept changing, right? I mean, we, we never knew what was going to happen. Uh, some days they would say, hey, we're going to get, you know, a mass casualty of 50 people. So we'd run around the hospital trying to get ready. Uh, and then uh, that wouldn't pan out. It would be, uh, oh, no, you know, they, they didn't come. Uh, for whatever reason. So the logistics wasn't just perfect, uh, but the, the things change. I mean, they just, can you still see me okay, Seva? Oh. Okay. I, I can, uh, if you can uh, put your screen back up, your slideshow oh, back uh, up. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Sure. So um, the, the situation on the ground, even though we were literally 20 miles from the border would change all the time. Uh, we would get a trickle of wounded, but it wasn't a mass, mass, mass casualty event. The, the busiest we got was the night that Shushi was in trouble. Uh, and at that point, it seemed like some of the floodgates opened and we started getting some very heavily wounded people um, who were being rescued uh, through the Laching corridor as best as they could get them to us. Um, so this was one day before that event. This is on the mountain of uh, Goris, by the way, is a gorgeous, gorgeous Armenian village sort of town. If you ever get a chance to go, it's surrounded by beautiful mountains. This is on top. This is on the road, literally to Artsakh, uh, heading east on the highway to Artsakh. Uh, they have these crosses all around the mountains. I mean, it just speaks to, to what we, we ultimately believe in, right? And these things light up. So you could see them from Goris looking up, you see a mountain basically of lit up crosses all night long. Um, the, the dock on the very, I guess, right of the picture is Rafi. I wanna make a special comment about him. He's from Montreal, I met him in Goris. He'd been in Goris about two weeks before I got there, literally showed up with a backpack uh, he's an ER guy like me, but he'd done a lot of ICU training. And he basically was an ICU doc. He was an anesthesiologist. He would do some ER. He would do bedside ultrasounds. I mean, he was literally a jack of all trades. And he just got on the rotation with the guys there uh, and, and take call every second or third night. Um, so we're basically on the mountaintop looking down. Behind us is Goris. The man in the middle is actually uh, one of the, the CFO of the hospital. So this is the day we went to Khunsodes, which is the military hospital, took some supplies with us, said, hey, what do you need? Can we bring you anything else? They had a pretty neat setup there, actually. I mean, but it was a true military hospital. Most of the docs there were, were military, except for a few gamavos, a few volunteers. Uh, now, we're most, these are all basically healthcare providers, Rafi, uh, Mariana is from England. She's a nurse practitioner who came and helped out tremendously. Uh, 
This is Armin from Glen, Glendale, uh, who did a phenomenal job in the ICU. David is the dinner and he's the chief, basically the chief of the hospital at Goris, and, and that's me. Uh, again, Goris behind us up on the mountains. Um, so uh, I'll tell you, I met some tremendous, tremendous people. This is Ripsime. So the night that Shushi was getting hit really, really hard, and Lachin was still close, but they still needed to get wounded there. A call went out and basically they would load up ambulances with three people, one the driver and a physician, typically a young physician like her residents, uh, and then uh, either a, a nurse or some sort of a medic. And they would head out to transport patients either to us from Stepanagir or wherever they can get them, or from us to Yerevan. So that, they, I think there were four crews that did that. So on Sunday night, when all hell broke loose in Shushi, these people started loading up and putting body armor on, helmets, the driver would have an AK-47, and they would literally just go into the battlefield to bring back the wounded. Um, at one point I see Hiripsima putting her stuff on, I said, and then she came up to me, she goes, you know, we really, uh, we, we think we really need you there because they were starting to have to intubate people there at Lachin or Bertsor before they were gonna, you know, bring them to Goris. I said, that's fine. So they brought me a body armor thing and those things weigh like a hundred pounds, it seems. I don't know how they could even wear them. Um, and we were ready getting loading up. And then again, the, the, the change of war, it literally would change minute to minute. They said, no, stand down, stand down. Two crews had already gone out and they came back. They said, we got everybody. Um, but I just wanted to show you these young Armenian women who, you know, she's probably in her mid to late twenties, um, you know, fresh out of school, early residency, braver than you can imagine going out there. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much life they've seen, but my guess is not as much as me. And and they were out there doing work in their magic, just amazing bravery. Um, so Sunday night, I ended up, that was my only night that I stayed up to take call in the ICU because at that point, you know, I was able to manage the vents and, and take care of the wounded. We had two badly wounded soldiers that came. One was uh, an injury through his thigh and he had bled out. Essentially, they actually coated him and Lachin before they brought him to us. So he came in intubated by one of these crews that went, um, needed a lot of blood. He was in the operating room for hours, I think about three or four hours. Um, so I took call to manage him uh, along with a woman who had been in a car accident. They were just the, the two, those two patients because the second wounded soldier, we, we treated and then shipped to Yerevan as soon as we could. Um, and so this is my note that I actually wrote my only Armenian progress note, let's say, because they don't have electronic medical records. Uh, my Armenian progress note describing how I had to take care of this elderly woman with a head injury uh, basically all night long. It was written on Monday morning uh, before I actually left Gori's hospital. So just a little tidbit. Now the soldier with the wound on the leg, um, he was basically in a coma. I mean, he got through surgery. I tell you, the, the surgeon was from Yerevan. Uh, he was uh, a volunteer. He stayed up. I've never seen a vascular surgeon do that before. He literally, not only did he sit up, you know, stay there during the procedure up until about two o'clock in the morning, he stayed up until eight o'clock with me uh, watching over the patient. I mean, you know, guys, here that, that doesn't happen, right? I mean, he was truly concerned and he wanted to make sure his patient was gonna pull through. So he did not leave the patient's bedside. Um, so Monday morning, they decided, okay, we have enough help now at Goris. The war still sort of going on, although situation in Shushi is not all that great. They, we got word, you know, the Dinorin at the hospital said, uh, they got word that they really need help in Vardenis or Vartenis, which is on the road uh, to Artsakh as well through Kelbajar. So there are really only two main 
roads that lead to Artsakh from Hayastan. One is through Lachin or Petsor, which is the, the standard fast route, right in, you know, through Shushi into Stepanagin. And then the northern route, which was a fairly new build, I believe, in the last three or four years that goes through, uh, uh, you know, uh, not Kelbaja, the Armenian, Karvaja, uh, where Dadi Vank is and all that, and then they would drop into uh, Stepanagin. So they sent me to Vardenis because there's a military hospital there as well, close to the border. They said they need you there. So that's where I headed out uh, Monday morning after being, uh, being on call. Uh, so here's Vardenis here. Uh, here's the border with uh, Hayastan and Azerbaijan. And this is all Azerbaijan. And you can actually see, uh, so this is the road that sort of drops down into, uh, drops down this way, I think, into Stepan again. Here's Karvajar and Kirbajar, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, the, so on this road is interesting. I don't know if you remember at the very beginning of the war, I believe the first week of the war, um, there was uh, Armenian military equipment that were shot and, and blown up. And this was it on, on the road. It was literally just on the outskirts of Vardenis. So we happened to take an ambulance ride out that way to make a call and we drove right by it. And I'm thinking, yeah, I mean, this was an international hit, literally. I mean, the Azeris used unmanned uh, 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 aerial equipment to destroy Armenian military equipment in Armenia. And that was the proof, in the, you know, right there. Um, so, I, I got to uh, Vardenis on Monday afternoon. Monday night, I went to bed. Tuesday morning, I wake up with my brother calling from Fresno saying, what the hell's going on? And that was when the agreement had been signed. And we didn't know. I mean, we, you know, because it happened at, I think, midnight or one o'clock our time, which was still, you know, uh, daylight and in, in, on the West Coast, but not, you know, we didn't know anything about it. Um, so that's when uh, I went over to the military hospital and that's where I met these guys. Uh, amazing bunch of people. Let me tell you, uh, again, the, the amount of support that Armenia got from Armenians who live in Armenia was tremendous. I mean, they literally dropped what they could and, and went to help in any way possible. So this is a military hospital. This guy's a military guy, this guy's a military guy. These two are husband and wife anesthesiologists, uh, literally dropped the, what they were doing in Yerevan uh, and came to work, came to help for no money, nothing, total volunteer. And they ran the, they ran the anesthesia department at, uh, at the Vartanis Military Hospital. Uh, I still keep in contact with them, wonderful guys. So, this guy here is an orthopedist. He's an anesthesia, and, and there's uh, there's me. Uh, Sean, um, um, yeah. Uh, well, maybe I, I just want to interject real quick. Uh, since you're showing these photos, uh, we have a question, and I, I I was thinking the same thing. Uh, we're all trying to social distance and be very careful with masks and so on. Yeah. What was it like in the, uh, in Armenia in general, but then in the hospitals when you're dealing with the with the war, but there's COVID. Uh, was COVID kind of out the window uh, when you're dealing with war or how, how, how was that being managed at the same time? Well, mostly, yes. I was probably the most paranoid. I know in these pictures, I don't have my mask on, but 95% of the time I wore my mask. I was absolutely paranoid about COVID. Um, and, and, and it was always in the back of my mind. And I, that was not a place I wanted to get COVID either. I mean, I just didn't know what kind of... Uh, uh, you know, what kind of health care that would be at that moment. But, uh, um, but yeah, most of the time, these guys did not worry about COVID. Now, um, interestingly, the, some of the nurses in the community hospitals, they would wear their masks more, at least in Gori stated. But um, speaking of COVID, so that's pretty much it for my pictures. Let me tell you, speaking of COVID, uh, uh, Sevag, I did, um, I did go on some uh, some trips, let me see. Okay, Is, are we still good? Yeah, yeah, please. I did make some uh, ambulance calls while I was in Gordis, just because we were, we had some downtime waiting for, you know, uh, uh, wounded to show up. Um, and COVID is spreading like absolute wildfire. 
it's people, some know about it, some don't, or some maybe just have, you know, the, I'll tell you the, the problem in Armenia is there are social things that they do that actually is very uh, bad for COVID. I mean, it, it, it helps COVID spread more, right? So we would go into a house. Now, Goris is a sort of a mountainous area, so it gets cool at night, uh, especially in November. Well, all the windows would be closed. Everybody would be huddled around a, a wooden burner in the middle of the biggest room they had, typically the living room and everybody would be together. And then there would be the hevant, the, the person that's sick sitting in the middle, uh, who's coughing, who's got fever and chills, obvious COVID symptoms. Um, and yeah, there's no air circulating, no one's wearing masks. I mean, it's, it's far from their thought process. And the other issue was we had nowhere we could take them. We hardly ever transported anybody to the hospital. Number one, Goris Medical Center was designated as a backup military so we didn't bring very many patients there and if somebody had COVID even if they were critical we would literally just tell them hey you got to call around hospitals and see if you could find a spot and it could be hours away so the, the situation with COVID is 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 horrendous there and it will I assure you will get worse uh, because they, they were not able to get take any precautions um, and and in, ge in general, did you, um, you, you talk about, I mean, first of all, I, I want to acknowledge the, the comments you've made about the people there. So there's obviously professionals deeply caring about society and the war and, and giving of everything they can to support um, the war effort. But uh, tell us just a little bit about the infrastructure. You talked about the Goris Hospital being in fairly new, pretty good shape, but then we have this kind of contradiction of uh, people not even really knowing about uh, uh, about COVID maybe and, and really knowing what to do about it or how to how to deal with it. What's the infrastructure there based on your general knowledge of, of the Armenian medical uh, uh, community um, and the, and what you saw was is is um, kind of where is it at and and uh, and then kind of looking forward to the recovery of Armenia and the recovery from this war and, and this humanitarian crisis. What needs to be done in the medical field to really help Armenia move forward and Artsakh? So the, the infrastructure depends where you are. Goris Medical Center was probably one of the nicer hospitals I've ever been to in Armenia, period. It was fairly new. It was fairly well stocked. Um, but again, the building's only so much. I mean, you know, the caregivers are, you know, I mean, you can have a building, but without, a, you know, decent docs or decent nurses, whatever, it, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go far. Um, and mind you, most of the physicians I s interacted with Goris, some were local, but a lot of them did come in either from Yerevan or came in from overseas. So I'm not, I'm not really sure how many solid docs there were in Goris to manage these patients. Now they did have, uh, decent number of ventilators, they'd gotten a supply of ventilators, even small, you know, some even potentially portable ones. Uh, but, you know, as you well know, COVID, you know, it could be 10 patients that have it, it could, there could be 100 patients and they don't have 100 vents. The ICU only literally had four beds. So, you know, after you put four people on a vent in that ICU, you're pretty much, you've maximized what Godis can do. And Godis is the only major medical center in Sunik, okay? Then you're gonna to have to move closer to Yerevan. Uh, when I was in Yerevan, they said the hospitals there were pretty packed. Uh, I just spoke to my friend, Sh uh, Anu Shavan, who was one of the anesthesiologists there uh, that I had the picture of. And he said, uh, the current problem now is COVID more so than the wounded. So the infrastructure, uh, it doesn't matter how advanced they may be, it's collapsing just from volume issues, right? It's no different than us. I mean, we have, uh, uh, we have volume issues here too. I mean, we have modern medicine, but you know, if you have a hundred patients that need uh, uh, beds and you only have 20 available, what do you do with the other 80? Um, so I, I, I worry about the, the armies in Armenia for sure. Uh, Vartenis, hospitals, um, 
the, the military side was okay, wasn't all that great, definitely not La Khunsoresk, but the, the civilian hospital was awful, absolutely awful. I mean, it's run down. Uh, in, in, Var in Vardenis, is that Vardenis. you were talking about? Ah, yeah. Which is, a, so it's a smaller, much more small, much smaller town than Goris. See, Goris is sort of a, number one, Goris is on the main highway from Iran, right? So there's a lot of traffic, a lot of, and then there's also, it's touristic. So uh, they probably are a little bit better off than places like Vardenis, which was not as developed. Um, it was scary. Um, we actually, the first call we went on, and there weren't enough doctors in Bartenis, that was for sure. Uh, not the, mil the military side that had some, but on the civilian side, they didn't have any. So the ambulances in Bartenis would go out with just a nurse. They wouldn't take a doctor. Oh, uh, wow. And the diagnostics were questionable at best. I mean, they literally would uh, check a blood pressure, listen to a heart, and that's it, you know? And they would diagnose and treat. Right then and there, they would hardly take patients back to the hospital because there's hardly anything there either. Um, the first person we actually saw um, uh, in the first call that we went to was uh, a person that had died. She, it was a, a woman in her 60s sitting on her couch uh, and she just went out. And by the time we got there, I mean, there was nothing you could do. And, and, and it took us, I mean, it was the next village over from Vartani. So it took us probably about 15 minutes to get there. I mean, and, and by then it was too late, you know. Uh, uh, and I don't think that was from COVID. They said she just had a broken heart from, you know, the agreement or whatever. But, but COVID is definitely, definitely a big, big deal right now. I mean, economically, well, just look at what it's doing to our country. So just imagine what it's going to do to them. Uh, you know, even in Yerevan, the stores uh, are not, you know, restaurants are not functioning very well. The stores in general are not well. Um, and then, you know, I don't, you know, we don't want to get politically sidetracked, but, you know, even when you have these protests and you have thousands of people standing around yelling and screaming, uh, majority of them without masks on, or even if they have masks on, it's either on their chin or on, you know, with the nose showing or whatever, you know, these are not, they are, this is not a responsible uh, scenario at this point because we are just getting into dire straits. Um, I tell you one place that I did go, Seba, and I don't know if, I think I may have that picture I can put up real quick for you. Uh, and I do have a couple questions for you when, uh, oh, sure. uh, as well, but. Uh, sure. Uh, let me see if I can pull my PowerPoint back up here. I guess I can't find it. Um, well, I went to Yerapulud. I don't know if you guys know where Yerapulud is or what it is. It's, it's basically the military cemetery um, on the outskirts of Yerevan. It's been in existence, as far as I know, at least since the Artsakh War, uh, the first Artsakh War. And uh, so uh, Yerapulud uh, um, was sad. I mean, it was crazy sad. The, I, all I could see were you know, freshly dug graves one after the other. Um, and it's just incredible. I mean, if, if you want to talk about um, true sacrifice, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old, just over and over, they couldn't dig them fast enough. I mean, while we were there, the, the backhoe was there and I just kept digging and digging and people were burying in one end and they were digging the hole right next to them. Uh, I mean, it's just, it was insanity. And I don't, Literally, when you walk up to Yerapulu, there's sort of a, an area like a gathering before you, and there's a little uh, madur there, there's a little mini church, and then before you walk to the actual burial sites. By the way, this is where all the, our heroes are buried, right? Guys like Monte and, and, and these guys. Um, and they literally had a table of, they had three setups. They could do three funerals at the same time, just because the volume was so high. I'm sorry. I mean, again, I'm not political, but when you see wounded soldiers who are, the, the part that I, I, I forgot to mention is on Tuesday, when, on Tuesday when the war basically was over and they were emptying out Stepanagev, 
uh, sending everybody through Vartenis to head back to Yerevan. They literally put the walking wounded in buses, like imagine a muni bus filled with yeah. Armenian soldiers who were wounded. And, and the first stop was Vartenis after a treacherous road to get there, probably about three or four hours. You walk in and they're all sitting there. They look not that much older than my son, probably close to my daughter's age, very close to my daughter's age with these blank faces, barely anybody said a word. I mean, and they refused any help. I mean, the guys that could barely walk, you take them in a wheelchair and you're offending them. They're like, no, I'll walk. And they just hobble over to a stretcher and they sit there. Um, their wounds were horrendous. And I'll tell you, the wounds are not like, hey, I got shot kind of a wound. There were explosions, it was shrapnel, it was tissue being torn, not an entrance and an exit wound like we typically see in traumas, you know, in traumas in the ER. Uh, so the, the, the fighting was not close. It wasn't, hey, you know, I see the Azeri enemy coming up on me and I'm gonna shoot them. You know, they're sitting there in their trench or in their armored vehicle. Next thing they know, it's being blown up. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it's terrible. I, you know, I love to sew. I mean, I, I love to repair wounds. And I'm looking at these wounds going, there's no tissue left. What do you put back together? I mean, it's shredded. Um, but they were tough. The, the one thing they would always want to know is if they were going to be amputated. I mean, I remember a guy who was barely awake. He was pale as a ghost because he bled quite a bit. We had to give him blood. And he just kind of called me over and he said, What's going to happen in my leg? Am I, am I going to keep my leg? I said, and I'm thinking, I'm like, well, hell, I don't know what to tell him. I mean, it didn't look as bad as, I mean, he had a pulse in his foot. So I'm guessing, yeah, you probably will. But, you know, is he going to get an infection? Is he, you know? So it, it's, it, it was very depressing. To be in Vartanis the last day, basically the end of the war, to see the wounded come through. So the dead had died. Now you've got this huge influx of wounded, you know, amputees, uh, traumatic brain injuries, psychological wounds. I mean, you name it, and these people are going to have it. And they're young. I mean, imagine being a 20 year old amputee Armenian, Armenian amputee living in a village somewhere and, you know, having to function that way. I mean, an am amputee here in the States can sort of still get around and get some care, but over there, I mean, it's it's going to be tough. We're we're still trying yeah. to figure out what kind of rehab they're going to get and, and all those things. And and kind of on 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 that front, uh, Shant, and and I want to just be mindful of the time. It's uh, eight o'clock here. It's later your way, so I, I respect your time. And uh, if you've got a few more minutes, I just maybe we can wrap up uh, with this question about um, to maybe a two part. One is, uh, what are you hearing? Kind of, you've been home for a month or so, I think, or a few weeks. What are you hearing from your colleagues and contacts that you made in terms of the aftermath? And uh, how, how is it looking from that humanitarian medical front uh, in the recovery of, uh, in the aftermath of the war? And then two, the question is asked, what can we as Armenian Americans do to support um, the, to support the, the health institutions in Armenia, the medical field, uh, to make sure that it's um, got what it needs, it can do what it needs to do, um, and, and make sure that it advances and progresses in the coming years, uh, as, as we all hope it will. Uh, so maybe we can, uh, I, I know folks have sent in a few more, few more questions, but I think uh, we can maybe end on that note, that would be, that would be great. That's fine, and I don't mind hanging around if people want to. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay on my end. But um, so, in terms of what I'm hearing from my colleagues, I just spoke to them yesterday. Look, first, I want to say that the, the young Armenian docs that I ran into were absolutely phenomenal, and they rarely ever wanted anything unless they truly needed it. So I'm, I was talking to Anushavan yesterday, and I said, "Hey, what can I do for you? What can I get?" He goes. Look, right now, I don't need anything. I don't need anything. So they're not, we have to get away from this, oh, high you know, uh, 
you know, maybe they want to take advantage of this situation, do this, do that. Um, we, we want to put those things aside. They are not a majority. They are definitely not a majority. Um, so the things that are needed right now, the Armenian uh, American and international medical groups are already working on. I was on a call uh, uh, last Sunday with AMIC. Uh, I think it's Armenian Medical International Committee. Um, and um, there were a lot of very, very amazing people on there. Mostly, uh, and this is an international thing. So there are Armenian uh, 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 doctors from Armenia, doctors from East Coast, West Coast, US, Canada, France. Um, and, and not just doctors, I'm sorry, healthcare providers. So we had physical therapists, we had uh, um, uh, psychologists. So we know what's necessary and they're already making inroads. The tricky part is some of it is logistical obviously, but it's also changing the mindset there, right? Armenians a lot of times are stoic. So. You know, you walk up to a wounded guy, go, hey, what do you need? He goes, I don't need anything. I'm fine. And you go, you know, you're obviously missing the leg or, you know, are you upset about it? No, I'm fine. And, you know, they, they want to push help away sometimes. And um, so they need to know that it's, they need to know that it's okay to ask for help, right? It's okay to say, you know what? I feel awful. Or I feel like, you know, my life is miserable or it's not worth anything. I feel like I want to blow my head off. I mean, you know, these are young people that were traumatized in ways that a military, a military any of any recent history has not gone through this kind of trauma. I mean, sitting in a tank not knowing when you're going to get blown up is not like being in the forest and defending yourself in a fight, right? I mean, you have a chance there. You can in a in a in a you know, physical fight where you see your enemy and you can say, okay, I can escape or I can do this, I can do that, I can have some strategy, fine. But the unpredictability of sitting and next thing you know, you're you're blown up with all your friends or somehow you live and your friends die. And it, it, it's 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 very, very scary to them. And, and they live, you know, I mean, these are nightmares that they'll live with forever. So yeah. my colleagues right now need, look, we cannot stop helping. My worry right now is that because of all the demonstrations and the protests and we're pro this, we're pro that, it's taking away from our absolute purpose of helping not just the wounded. You've got, you know, wounded mentally, wounded physically. You've got the, the soldiers that died and they have families that they were supporting. On top of that, you've got people with COVID and then on top of that, you've got just the people in Yerevan and our, or Armenia as a whole who, are, who don't have jobs because the economy is so bad. So, I mean, this is not the time to back off on Armenia because of whatever political differences you may have. Think of the people. Think of, of the suffering. I mean, if, if I don't know what mom, my mom would do if she lost me when I was 18 years old. I don't know what she would do. I mean, my guess is she would have a hell of a life. Well, how do you take care of those moms? How do you take care of the, the children? I mean, when I'm walking around Yeraplut, you know, let's say they buried a 40 year old man and he's got two sons there and you know, who takes care of them? I mean, we gotta, fine. I mean, politics, politics, so be it. But, you know, keep funding Armenia Fund. Home, Armenian uh, Relief Society, you can't, you know, they're doing amazing things. There are people on the ground. I know you guys are on Facebook. I mean, Sharshaf, the guy who's, you know, I, I watch uh, Shant all the time. He's he's amazing. He's got a, you know, he, he lets it loose. He's Glendale star, right? He's from LA. But, you know, at the end of the day, he drives from home to home and gives people stuff. You know, it's, they need money. They need food. They need shelter. It's Christmas time. I mean, for God's sake, just be mindful that these people need us. So from the medical standpoint, you know, the AMIC is helping. We actually are creating an Armenian uh, emergency physicians organization. We had our first meeting yesterday by Zoom because, you know, ambulances need help. 
emergency, we need an emergency uh, uh, medicine residency. They need to know how an ER works so they can have more effective uh, uh, healthcare. Look, Sevag and all the listeners, this is not over. I mean, this is just a prelude to what's going to come next. So, you know, we can sit and cry about losing churches and hotchkars and, and territory and this, but look, uh, imagine what happens in another few years when, when this agreement, whatever the hell it is, comes back into, into play. I mean, how are we going to be prepared then? And if you think the Russians are going to help us, well, this should have been a clue that we're at people's mercy that we can't trust. So, you know, we need to really uh, think hard and fast about people other than ourselves, right? The, the Armenians and Armenians sacrificed more than anybody else, period, done. I didn't do crap, okay? I went there, you know, a week and a half, two weeks. I did what I could. I was never really in any major danger. And I always knew that I can fall back to my comfortable life. What do they have to fall back on, right? I mean, they don't have choices. It's, it's what they're dealt. So, you know, Anyway, that, that, that's my take. I don't want to belabor the point, but the suffering is great. And the ANCA is doing tremendous work. Obviously, $250 million is, is $250 million. It's not a joke. I mean, it's, it's more than Armenia Fund raised in the last two months. So, you know, yes, call the congressman, call senators, educate people. I feel like I was sort of a tool, right? I mean, I live in Tennessee. And I'm not surrounded by Armenians, but all my American colleagues and friends and nurses and everybody around me knows about Armenia now, right? So I was sort of a tool. I'm like, oh, Dr. G is going to Armenia. What's going on? Let me look it up. Let me, you know, educate everybody because it's not just Armenian voices that need to be heard, right? I mean, we're a Christian people. We're absolutely getting clobbered, nobody's standing up for democracy, nobody's standing up for religion, nobody's standing up for any of that. All the things we'd hope that people would stand up for, they're not. So, but they will stand up to the vote, right? And say, hey, call your congressman and say, so if people want, or if Americans, you know, my American colleagues wanted to, you know, hey, what can we get you? What can we get you? I said, all you can get me is call, you know, here's the number to your congressman or your senator, call them, tell them to stop this this war, this killing, this is ridiculous. That's that's a yeah, perfect message, uh, Shant. Uh, the the comments you make about uh, Armenia still needing us, still needing our engagement. That there's so much work still to be done. Uh, there's a lot of rebuilding and recovery that needs to happen, and Armenia will play its role. Uh, Artsakh will play its role, and like you said, the people on the ground there. They, they gave the most and, and they will continue to give the most in the rebuilding of their own country. Um, but we have a role to play as well um, uh, through the Armenian National Committee to advocate uh, uh, for Armenia and Artsakh here in the United States. Uh, the 250 million is critical, it's the start. I, don't, I think to your point, this is just the beginning. Uh, there's a very long road and long tail to this. And uh, the work uh, began, begins and will continue. The 250 million is uh, for everyone's benefit is really more of a stopgap humanitarian effort. That is not uh, the be all and end all. Uh, ANC and other organizations will be advocating for much more long-term commitments, uh, including the Millennium Challenge Corporation Compact for Armenia that invests in science, technology and arts education Armenia has benefited multiple times from that. And that those are huge dollars that go into a country and focus on those areas of education. Armenia kind of fell out of qualification for the Millennium Challenge um, uh, over the last recent years, but because of the war may kind of requalify uh, for that. And we hope to promote and, and push that as well with our elected leaders in Washington. So pay attention to the emails. Uh, make those calls, make the effort. Um, Shant, you've got a lot of fans on the on the comment section here. I can't read everything, but I can assure you that uh, everyone is incredibly grateful 
for your effort, for taking the time, making the effort to go to Armenia. Um, while you weren't necessarily, as you say, in danger, it was uh, certainly a dangerous situation, but you willingly went and, and put your um, personal life aside and went to contribute to our country and to the war effort. And, and we're so grateful. Um, and we're also grateful to have you back safe uh, at home uh, with, with your family. Uh, this, uh, at the end of this year, it's been uh, a, a, a heck of a year, as they say. Uh, but uh, working together, we're gonna move forward and, and using the great experience of people like you on the ground, uh, advocating in places like Tennessee, using your skills on the ground as a doctor, um, where we, uh, we can use everyone, someone commented, we all have something to give. One of the comments here that we're all in different professions. We can all play a role uh, and contribute, and, and certainly we 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 can and we should. So, um, I, I you know unless there are any other, I'm not seeing too many other questions. A lot of comments. So I want you to read all those comments, uh, Shant, and I'll leave you with a final word if you like, uh, just to close out tonight's event. So I uh, just a minute ago at 10:14 to be exact. Although there's a lot of 10:14s. So well, no, there's only a couple. I did put my email address there if, if anybody has any specific questions. I mean, it's, look, I was there for uh, two weeks. It was, you know, somewhat action packed the first week for sure. Uh, and, and sometimes I get pretty excited and, and it's hard to sort of, you know, focus on one particular thing. So if anybody has questions that we didn't cover a topic that you wanted to know more, I, I please feel free to email me. It's sgarabedian at charter.net, uh, but, uh, and I can try to communicate with you. Look, um, uh, I would definitely do it all over again, Sevak, not a question. Um, there was no way for me to know when things would end. I had every intention of being there longer. Maybe next time I may just have to go sooner. Uh, but um, yes, the, we're, we're all Armenian, right? We're smart people. I mean, for God's sake, I mean, you've got, you know, I mean, look at the, the people that develop stuff, right? I mean, from airplanes to, to vaccines, I mean, we've got them all. So, you know, this brain power, because that's all this was. This war was not about AK-47s hiding in a forest. It was technology. We've got that, you know? We just got to put it, to, to proper use, at least from the defensive standpoint, you know? I mean, we don't wanna sacrifice any more lives. We don't have that many lives to sacrifice. You know, we're not like the Turks and the Azeris. By the way, to save their lives, they used other people to, 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 to do the fighting, right? So, I mean, you know, we're 3 million here, 10 million there, whatever the case may be. And, and each million of me is worth 100 million of theirs. So please, we need to use our brains uh, and, 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 and gather our thoughts and gather our, our efforts to make something good come out of this scenario. I mean, we can sit and belabor these points or we shoulda, we coulda, we do, you know, it doesn't matter. We were outgunned. There's no question about it. No question about it. Thank you all so much. And I'm sorry uh, uh, if this took too long, I'm, I'm uh, uh, and honestly, I, if you guys want to stay, I'll stay too. We do, we do have one more question, uh, Shant, if, uh, uh, since uh, I can't resist a question from Roxanne Makashian. She, uh, oh, yes, of we have to, she put it in the, uh, she put it in the uh, uh, comments and, and uh, because we didn't have too many other questions, uh, I'll just say this is a little different. So we've been talking more on the medical side and humanitarian, but she asked to what extent do you think it will be helpful for rank and file diasporans to go to Artsakh to help with anything, including securing the new border um, in the sparsely populated Armenian villages uh, near the new border with Azerbaijan, or kind of in addition to that, is there anything that diasporans can do directly on the ground in Artsakh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, to contribute there? I, you know. Uh... Uh, I don't know, Sevag, I don't know what the right answer there is. I'll tell you this, they love to see diaspora Armenians. I mean, it doesn't matter who it was. You're like, if you show up, especially outside of Yerevan, okay, Yerevansis are sort of used to seeing, uh, uh, you know, tourists come through, right? But, 
you know, when you go to Gordis, you go to Vartanis, you're like a rock star, you know, because they love to know that there's, that, that people, Armenians outside of Armenia are thinking about them, right? And care about them. So if you show up at Artsakh and you say, hey, I wanna help you in any way I can, you have far more beings and access to things than they ever will. At the very least, you've got a phone or you've got a, a Facebook messenger and you can you know, tell somebody back home, say, hey, these guys need this and then bam, things start to happen. Um, you know, we have the means. To, to, here's the bottom line. Armenia cannot survive without uh, the diaspora. And without the diaspora, uh, without Armenia, the diaspora will fade, right? I mean, that's the whole issue. So we, it's got to be a symbiotic relationship. So to answer Roxanne's question, specifically, I don't know if there's an emergent need for uh, American Armenians or French Armenians or Lebanese Armenians to show up in a village in Artsakh and say, hey, what can I do? But, you know, like Sharshaf on Facebook, heck, he's just going around loading his car with stuff and dropping them off from money to goods to whatever. That works too. They need that too. The one thing you don't want to be is a burden, right? That's the and that's how I approached my trip. I didn't want to get there and say, hey, somebody bring me this, somebody bring me that. I literally had a sleeping bag and boots and winter clothes with me in my suitcase because I didn't know where I was going to end up. I didn't want to say, hey, I need a bed. I need a cover. I need this. I need that. I didn't need anything. You put me wherever and I'll just survive, right? I mean, so go there with the intent of, Number one, you don't want to complain a lot, right? I mean, it's 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 pointless to get there and say, oh, Dr. Churchunek, um, oh, Hosan Kincherav, oh, Wi-Fi Ure, uh, uh, you know, Bet Karana. So for the non uh, non uh, Armenian speakers, hey, what happened to the Wi-Fi? What happened to the electricity? What happened to the hot water? You can't do that stuff, right? You know, you, you you're thankful and 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 you uh, you appreciate what they have. I mean, it's. Uh, and let me tell you, these guys will give the shirt off their backs. You leave, don't judge Armenia by Yerevansis. Yerevansis are still decent, but you go to the villages. I mean, when I was at Vartanis, the civilian hospital side, they fed me, you know, every uh, lunchtime. But the, the nurses got together and, and got stuff together and fed me. I tried to pay them. They were absolutely offended. They said, you can't. So you're not going to pay money for bread. I said, well, I'm not. I mean, I just, you know, I want to contribute. No, nope. I mean, they don't have a pot to piss in for the lack of a better term, and they will give them anything. You know, I've been in contact with the family there. I, I sent them a little something just as an appreciation from here. They have not stopped calling me for two weeks. For two weeks. Oh, Sabadane Masfats by It's like, Okay, enough already. I mean, I'm, I'm good. I think, you know, they are so appreciative. So yes, go. Honestly, I want to go there. I, at some point, want to live there. My wife, hopefully, may be asleep by now. I don't know. But there are, there are some <laughs> inner workings of maybe buying some property on the outskirts of Yerevan because medicine needs help, right? We need to upgrade the healthcare there. Um, they're not terrible, but they're not to our standards, right? They're just not, and there's room to expand. They're basically about maybe 30, 40 years behind us at this point in, in some things, you know? Um, so yeah, I think it's worth it, man. It's, I was ecstatic to be there. I, I honestly, the only reason I left is because of the protests. I would have stayed, but the protests got unpredictable. I mean, isn't that awful? I mean, he, here's a guy that's come 8,000 miles away that wants to give a helping hand and I'm worried about getting tangled up with protesters. I'm like, well, this is, you know, it defeats the purpose. <laughs> well, I hope, uh, I, I know you'll get back there and you have so much more to contribute uh, uh, both from your professional standpoint and just the fact that you're just a wonderful person. And I know you're gonna do great things in Armenia and, 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 and in Tennessee. So um, I, I wanna thank you, uh, Sean, so much uh, for, for being here, kind of uh, walking through, 
your journey with us, uh, giving us some highlights, some stories, some important things to think about. Uh, to our viewers, I uh, want to thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, we've had regular town hall meetings like this throughout the year. We'll continue to have more in 2021, uh, especially since we're all still kind of locked down in our homes. So as long as that continues, you'll be seeing us virtually. We look forward to the day when we can gather together as a community of supporters to get together in person and have wonderful guests like Shant, uh, Dr. Garabedian, and others uh, join us and uh, continue these important conversations, both to learn, but also to, to, to ask questions, to challenge ideas and thoughts, um, and, and uh, uh, to participate in the process, this, this process of advocating for Armenia and Artsakh uh, here in the United States. I'll again remind you, anca.org slash alert is really the place for all the immediate priorities uh, that the ANCA is working on, and that's the place to get information. But as you all do, and I know you do, uh, stay on social media, your favorite platforms. That's where the information goes first, typically. That's where you're going to find it, and that's where you can react immediately uh, to some of the requests being made. So with that, again, Dr. Garabedian, thank you. Please say hello to your family. We miss them terribly. We wish them well. Everyone have a healthy, safe uh, rest of your year. Have a great night. Thank you, Sivak. Thank you, buddy. Take care. Good night.